Spend hours on the perfect scene, but Blender needs days to show you the results. Got a project deadline coming up tomorrow, but Blender's saying nope. Rendering in cycles can be a huge pain, but it doesn't have to be if you know what you're doing. There's tons of reasons why you might want to speed up your renders, and whether you own the fastest PC on Earth or a literal potato, rendering can be very, very frustrating. Luckily, there's a solution that can be applied to any project to speed up your render times. When you're finally able to hit render on your project, your goal is a clean and noise-free render as fast as possible. Sadly, noise-free and fast don't go hand in hand, which forces you to start this balancing act of tweaking settings, optimizing your scene, and denoising methods. And I think it all starts with optimization. Most videos on render speed improvements start with changing a bunch of settings like samples and noise threshold, but sometimes all you really need is to optimize your scene better. And the great thing about this is that it might save you from actually having to lose quality in terms of samples and those things later on down the line. Now, as a benchmark, we have this scene here. It has many of the common render boogeymen, a lot of geometry, high quality textures, and a semi-transparent material. If we render it with the default Blender settings, this takes roughly one minute and 20 seconds for a single frame. This means an animation of around five seconds and 30 FPS, which isn't a long one, by the way, would take roughly 10 and a half hours to complete. Um, future Kaizen here, I consider using a GPU for rendering a default setting, so consider this a PSA for checking whether you have your GPU enabled and set to the correct device following this chart. Also make sure Blender is using GPU compute now in the render settings. This is the hardware that I use by the way, and if you want to test out with this project for yourself, there's a free download link in the description so you can test out too. Please do comment your render times if you do so. So now we have our benchmark and there's a lot to gain here. The first step for optimization is checking unnecessary geometry. We want the total geometry now close to 12.4 million verts to be as low as possible without losing detail on any models in the scene. There's actually two objects in this scene which are identical because I copied them over. This means that even though they are identical, Blender is loading all of that data twice because it's not a shared copy or a so-called instance. By replacing Placing the second object with an instanced copy, which you can add by going shift a collection instance and copying the entire collection into an instance, this immediately halves our poly and texture count. Next, we can control the overall geometry density through a tool called Simplify. I've mentioned it before and it can be found and enabled under the render settings and by changing the max subdivision setting in both viewport and render down to two or three. From six, we immediately lower our overall poly count to around one million, since the object here has a subdivision modifier. We can also set a lower texture limit, which will effectively lower the overall texture resolution to decrease the render time further. The best thing about the simplify option is that it affects everything in your scene, including objects and textures out of camera, which will still all attribute to slower renders inside of Blender. So it's especially noticeable on scenes that have tons of objects and textures. In particular for HDRIs, this can make a huge difference. Rendering a default cube scene with a 16K HDRI takes around 49 seconds for me. And rendering that same cube scene with the texture limit set to 1024 takes around 15 seconds. So that's a major improvement. Now I do want to note that if you have a reflective object or you can actually see the HDRI textures up close somewhere or the HDRI in the background for that matter, it will lose a lot of detail. So you might want to abstain in that case. Try to set this value to something sensible and re-render to see if it's good enough just to make sure that you don't mess up your final render. Now also under Simplify, there's another interesting optimization that we can use to improve render speed, and it's called culling. To put it simply, culling means that objects outside of your camera bounds are removed, because in 3D, these all still count towards the total render time, even though they're not visible in the frame. Let's enable camera culling, there it is. And nothing really happens because Blender needs to know which objects it needs to call. So I'm just going to select each of these Cezannes here, then go to the object properties and in the visibility tab, hold down alt and click on use camera call. And there we go. It should now work. Now do know that this only works in rendered view. So in solid view, it doesn't work, but in rendered view, it does work. And it also updates automatically because when I move this, as you can see, it updates the culling. Now it's a bit 
laggy because it needs to update with 11,000 objects, but in the final render, this will make a difference. Before, the Simplify lowered any textures and subdivisions like these backup assets that I have out of frame here, but with camera calling, it altogether removes them or excludes them, I should say, from the render, again, optimizing our scene for the render at no difference to the final product. Now, if you do have tons of objects close to the camera that you wanna hear in reflections and such, but they're not in the actual frame, you know, want to make sure that the margin here is set up in a way that it doesn't remove objects that should appear in your reflections. All right, so with all of the optimizations done, the new render comes out to one minute and 10 seconds, which is already a nice save compared to the original, but we can do a lot better. So let's get into step two to get the perfect, quick and clean render settings. Rendering kind of comes with experience in Blender, and I've got the perfect solution to that. Skillshare, the sponsor of this video. Skillshare offers literally hundreds of Blender classes, and there's one in particular that will teach you all the ins and outs about Blender's interface, tools, and settings. Blender 3D Crash Course for Absolute Beginners by Dave Reed. Dave has a very easygoing and ASMR heavy style of teaching, making it super nice to learn the very basics of Blender. I took the course myself just to see if my knowledge was up to speed, and I'm happy to say that it was. <laughs> Anyways, Dave does a great job explaining, and if you're ever confused about learning Blender and its interface and tools, just like I was plenty of times when I began learning Blender, this class is a great solution to that. In addition to Blender classes, Skillshare has tons of creative classes taught by amazing world-class creatives on illustration, photography, editing, design, productivity, and so much more. So if you want to learn practically any skill, the first 500 people to use the link in my description or scan the QR code on screen, will get a one month free trial of Skillshare. Make sure to get started today. It's a pretty broad term, settings, because it means everything from having a GPU enabled with the latest drivers installed and the correct render device selected to having the right amount of samples, noise threshold, resolution, and tons of other small tweaks to your render settings. So let's begin by determining the render resolution because it's a nice starting point to do so. In most cases, 1080p or 1920 times 1080 will be plenty, but if your PC can handle it, going bigger is always better for image clarity. 2K, 1440p or 2516 times 1440 is what I tend to use, but if you're creating animation for currently common TVs and computer screens, you might even want to go up to 4K, 2160p or 3840 times 2160. By increasing resolution, you increase render time a lot. Blender renders based on the amount of pixels it needs to calculate. The difference between a 1080p and 4K render is about 6.2 million pixels. The difference alone between those two is already three times bigger than the original pixel count of just the full HD image. And all those pixels also mean 6.2 million additional calculations that Blender needs to do, which for animation also means that it needs to do all those millions of calculations extra each individual frame. And for a longer animation, this can easily go up to billions of additional calculations just because you have a higher resolution. So what I'm trying to say here is use resolution wisely. My advice is to use the following flowcharts to choose the right resolution for your project. You can also find a link to this flowchart in the description so you can save it for future reference. In this project, I have a variation of 2K, 1280 times 1440p just to get a different aspect ratio, but I still wanted to use the general 1440p pixel level density. Now I could go down to a 1080p version of this and definitely save on some render time here. However, because I want to keep this level of clarity, I'm going to keep it at 1440p, but do think of your own specific purpose for your project and what makes sense. Now, next up, we have the noise threshold. This is a super effective setting that requires a decent amount of back and forth to get the right value per project. What noise threshold does is that it looks at each of those millions of pixels that comprise your image. And once that pixel has less noise than the threshold value, I don't know how that technically works, but at least that's what it does. It will stop rendering it. You can use any value from 0.001 to one with higher values resulting in faster and noisier renders. In the default cube scene, for example, the difference is night and day with the noise threshold at 0.001 taking around five seconds per frame. And with it at one, it takes less than a single second. I tend to use 0.03 as my default noise threshold, 
Sometimes we're bringing it up to 0.1 depending on the project. Now, in this case, we have a lot of translucency, transparency, so we need to keep it relatively low and I think the 0.03 will work just fine. And all of that leads us to sampling. Flashback. Now, in my last video on render settings, I explained that I just leave it at 4096, the default, because the noise threshold cuts it off at a certain point anyways. Now, a year later, I still generally agree with this statement. As the sample count means, the amount of samples the noisiest part of your image is able to use to clear up each pixel. However, some projects don't necessarily need that amount of samples. Visually, there's hardly a difference in a lot of cases between 4096 and 2000 samples, and sometimes even going as low as 1000 samples won't make a difference in the grand scheme of things, as we'll fix this later on with denoising. Now, in this case, I think 1000 is going to be just fine. It's a relatively simple image, and denoising is doing a great job in fixing it, so let's leave it at 1000. However, the noise threshold also uses this sample count. It uses the max samples and it uses the minimum samples, meaning the lowest amount of samples any pixel gets. So the difference is a very noisy pixel will now get your max samples, but a non-noisy pixel is getting zero samples basically, or I guess it would get one. So by default, it's set to zero, but to compensate for the higher noise threshold value that we have and the lower sample count that we're using, I think it's good to up the minimum samples to something like 20 so basically all parts of the image do get some samples to work with it just generally results in a more clear image especially when working with lower settings the noise is checked off for now even though this is one of the most important steps to a clean and render but we'll get back to that later on for now let's move on to all the other settings under the lights tab there's a setting called light tree this is a setting that samples multiple lights to clear up noise which sounds like a good thing but also comes at a performance cost. This scene only has five lights, which in most cases means the light tree setting can be disabled. If you were to render a shot with dozens or hundreds of lights, like a Christmas tree for example, you definitely want it on because it will improve your render speed significantly, but in a scene with few lights like this one, it can go off. Next we have the advanced tab, which for pretty much everyone only has one important feature, an animated noise seed. By turning this on, the noise pattern for every frame will be different, which feels more natural like a camera would produce and usually results in a better denoising result over longer animations. Quick editor's note here, if you don't want to mess around with all of this yourself, you can buy my render preset file to save you some time and get the best settings right away. There's a link in the description down below. Next, we have a very scene dependent setting that can shave off a lot of time light paths, specifically the max bounces. Setting all of these to one will make your renders ultra fast, but also usually not very pretty. So what I recommend is going into your camera view, set it to rendered view, enable viewport denoising, and then set all the bounces except the total to one. Now increase each of them individually until you don't see any noticeable difference happening in your viewport. Finally, set your total bounces to the added value of the diffuse, glossy transmission and volume. Now below that, there's clamping, which I tend to leave alone as I don't like the effects this has on scenes. And finally, in light paths, we have caustics. In a lot of projects, I recommend turning caustics off, but as we're working with transparent and glossy materials here, we need to have it on. This leaves us with the final settings tab, performance. First of all, there's the compositor setting, which I have set to GPU because I own a fast one, but it will depend on your hardware for you. In hefty compositing scenes, having it set to GPU can save seconds on each individual frame, so it's a good thing to play around with. Okay, so tiles. Some people claim that having a lower tile value speeds things up, but in my testing, it either didn't make a change at all when I set it to a higher value, or it made the render a lot and I mean a lot slower when setting into a lower value like 128. I think it's worth play testing this, but overall um, for me, it's never been a net positive. So I just leave it at the default 2048. Finally, we have the biggest setting in the performance tab, persistent 
data. By enabling this, Blender stores all the information it needs to calculate a frame, like the BVH and multiple importance map, whatever those are, in your RAM instead of loading it every frame, resulting in a new render time of about 13 seconds per frame with all of these settings changed, which is a major improvement over the initial one minute and 20 seconds, but persistent data only kicks in after rendering your scene at least once before because it needs to store the data once. Which brings me to the most important point when it comes to settings and the thing that sets it apart from optimization, your project. Optimization is always good. Anyone will benefit from removing unnecessary geometry, textures that are set too high, removing out of camera objects, and you know, doing all of these optimization changes. But everything we just discussed in the settings chapter is mainly relevant for animations. Because if you just want to render a single frame for a poster or, you know, whatever reason you want to render a single frame, you should just do all your look dev in the viewport. And when you're ready, crank up the samples, make sure you have the right resolution and just let it rip. You know, who cares that it takes an hour? It's just one time that you have to do that. Besides all of these settings, especially the noise threshold, samples and light paths are also very, very custom to your scene. By doing what I've done in this video, your scene might be terrible, it might be slow to render, it might look like crap. You know, there's a bunch of reasons to test out all these settings per project. So getting this right can be the difference between a super slow render and a very fast one, which will also look great. That is, if you at least know how to do the final and most important step of rendering, denoising. It's been a much discussed topic. And to be frank, it's the only reason we still have somewhat of our sanity left denoising. Without it, getting an acceptably clear render would easily require 20 to 30,000 samples. I actually took one for the team here and did a 20k samples test render just to show you that it's still going to be worse than 1000 samples with denoising. So we all know that denoising works wonders. Which version do you choose then? I used to be a fan of optics, believing it to be superior, especially for animations. However, with the latest changes to open image, I think it's become much better than optics. The results are extremely consistent. It can use your GPU for denoising, and there's a bunch of customizability to it. You can either access it through the denoise checkbox in the sampling tab, or do it through the compositor. Personally, I like to use the compositor, and I believe most professional artists do too, just because it offers up more flexibility. It's really easy to set up. Go to your view layer tab and enable denoising data. Then in the compositor at the denoise node, set it to accurate, quality high, and connect all the required sockets. You can also enable HDR to preserve HDR colors, which is good for when you're working with HDR images, and it preserves these color values instead of clamping them down. Not only can you tweak the strength of the denoising by recombining it with the original noisy image, it also allows you to denoise certain layers individually, like for example, a mist or a light pass. And this all sounds like a no-brainer, but it wasn't 3D if there weren't a few drawbacks. First of all, it costs time to do denoising with slower hardware, taking up to seconds to compute it per frame. However, it'll always be worth it compared to a very high sample count in terms of your total render time to get a clean image. In this specific project, it hardly cost any time. And in fact, the denoise render was slightly faster, clocking in just below 13 seconds. Second, denoising can lead to denoising artifacts, blotchy spots that make an image look ugly and are especially noticeable in animations. We're combating that with the animated noise seed to generate a more natural noise pattern, resulting in this effect being less visible. And by using the open image denoise albedo and normal inputs, which were set up in the compositor there, to capture a lot of the data in the scene instead of losing it to the denoising algorithm. This preserves a lot of detail when using this specific method for denoising. But even with all of that, it can still happen due to a too low sample count or a too high noise threshold, leaving the denoiser with too much guesswork to do. So in that moment, you're back to tweaking your settings to get the best result possible. Denoising is incredible, but it's not a fix all and it won't make up for poor settings and optimization. Luckily, you now know just how to get the best render settings possible, which took me years of failing and getting back up to learn myself. But you don't have to do all that because you can learn from my mistakes in this video right here.